Ah, uh, thank you. Whew. Wow, what a stage. Right? And being on a boat like this, wow, well, it's uh, kind of a special treat. As many of you know, this was the recovery vessel for Apollo 11 and 12, and so uh, as a space nut, I just love being here. And thanks for having me. I've been asked to talk the most, about the most unusual topic today, so I'm going to try to make it really relevant to everyone in the room, even though at first it may not sound that way. And that is, what are we in the midst of using iterative algorithms, and I'll explain what I mean by that, to eventually get to superintelligence, meaning an AI greater than a human consciousness? That's a pretty broad sweep of topics, but the reason I like it as a framework is it captures much of what's going on that's exciting in the world right now in technology, especially around areas of deep learning, uh, evolutionary biology, generative design, and basically the cutting edge, if you will, of how we do engineering. I think that's all in the midst of a profound shift, and the reason I'm interested in that is as a venture capitalist and investor, we want to invest in entrepreneurs who are changing the world, who have big dreams, aspirations, but usually need some reason why the seas are changing, why the rules of the game are changing, and there's nothing quite like a major technology disruption or fundamental change in how we engineer products that gives opportunities for new entrants. So hopefully that'll be interesting to any entrepreneur or anyone thinking about the application of software, broadly defined. Um, some context, I, until March, was a founding partner of DFJ. I'm now, as I learned last night around midnight, it got snuck out somehow that I'm be starting a new venture fund later in the year called Future Ventures, but that wasn't something I intended to announce today. But I threw the domain name up there because it got pre-announced by others uh, last night. But I don't have much to say about that other than the future is exciting and I'm looking forward to it. What I'll do today, uh, first as a caveat, is mention for context the kinds of companies that I have been working with for the last 23 years because that infuses much of my thinking about where the future is heading and where I think exciting opportunities lie. And frankly, anything I might share with you today that's interesting is probably something I learned by listening to the entrepreneurs that I've been working with over the years. So in the crypto space, um, there's a couple of companies at the bottom at the DFJ era and then the top two more recently um, that are doing all kinds of interesting things. Right? You'll hear actually from Orchid later today, uh, if they're successful in their vision, they'll make the great firewall of China an obsolete idea. And so stay tuned for that with Steve Waterhouse later, I think 5 p.m. Switch presented a day or two ago and they are in the long run of what they're doing, bringing efficiencies to energy markets and energy uh, carbon capture. Um, in a sense, need to build an AI that will solve the climate problem. And that is a big, hairy problem. And uh, uh, I will leave Evan and Peter and others in the audience to explain how they intend to do that. But basically using the blockchain to track and optimize what is a very inefficient and broken market today, they hope to make profound change in that, um, in that sector of climate. More generally, and looking back over the last 20 years, it's been a wide array of industries, everything from clean meat in the upper left to new types of robots, new types of autonomous vehicles. These are the companies on the right here that I led the first round of venture investment in, um, in almost every case, and in, in the vast majority of cases took the first board seat um, from the outside. So these are the companies that I know the best and will use anecdotes from them. So in a spirit of full disclosure, I realize, of course, I have an economic stake in those companies, but then I can also speak a little more clearly and freely about them. Okay, now, <laughs> I have to start with this. The reason is, no matter what I was asked to speak about today, this would inevitably be part of the conversation. And so I have to ask, how many people have seen this before or something like it, which is the long-term version of Moore's Law? It's what Ray Kurzweil first popularized. I just want to get a count of hands. I actually am really curious. Oh, good. Good. This may be the highest percentage I've ever seen, which is just over half the room. Um, I'll spend much less time on it then than I normally would. But the reason I want to show it is it's, I think, the most important thing ever graphed. Uh, writ, writ large, I mean, in any context ever. So what you're seeing is a logarithmic scale or an exponential scale up the side, right? That's not an incremental. A straight line on a graph like this is an exponential curve. And you have a curve going back 120 years. And what's astounding is there's these major shaded regions, these technology epochs labeled at the top. Everything from simplistic mechanical computing to the integrated circuit of today. And if you plot the best price performance computer of the day, meaning what can $1,000 buy or how much computation can I buy per dollar spent, so, you know, accounting for inflation and all that, you find that these computers lay on an incredibly smooth curve. It's really spooky in a way that it's not random or fits and starts that, that in a sense, almost philosophically, humanity's capacity to compute has been compounding continuously since long before people even thought to measure it, right? Because most of these data points, no one knew they were on a curve. They weren't trying to hit a curve. They just did what they were doing. And if you I can label some of the machines so you know what's there, and perhaps, unless you've seen me present it before, this has been updated with 10 years of data beyond what Ray Kurzweil originally had, and it includes all the data points from NVIDIA. And as we'll come to see later in the presentation, NVIDIA really is holding the vanguard of Moore's Law today. Intel has long since given the baton up to others um, for really carrying forth the vanguard of where computing is at. 
certainly in the area of machine intelligence, which is increasingly, frankly, uh, by the way, NVIDIA had a recent statistic, which is kind of mind-boggling, and in their estimate, 90% of all code written today is generated by a computer. Let me say that again. 90% of all code written today is generated by a computer, not a human, and specifically in the area of neural networks. These are auto-generated processes where you do an iterative algorithm of growing computer code, much like you might evolve in biology, over millions and billions and trillions, in some cases, of iterations into a complex product that does something useful. We'll come back to that later. But that's where the vast majority of compute cycles are today. So it's somewhat appropriate to include that in Moore's Law. It's also exogenous to the economy. World War I, World War II, the Great Depression had not had any meaningful impact here. Now, the reason I belabor this is if you just plot this curve out another 20 years, you get to you know, a trivial amount of money, $100, giving you the computational capacity of a human brain. And then the, big, the question that begs is, do we have the software to be as intelligent as a human brain if we have the same computational element, right? There's nothing magical about meat-based computing, as Sam Harris would put it. There's nothing particularly um, dualist that we, we, that we need to take for granted. It's probably a tougher argument to argue why we won't have intelligent machines than to argue that we, that we will. Uh, the default assumption should be, why wouldn't we? And the method for getting there is very much the same method we got there with our brain, which is very much akin to biology and evolution itself. And that gives us confidence we'll get there. I'll say more about that later. Now, Moore's Law, stepping back from AI for a moment, just in general, is the perpetual driver of disruption that allows new entrants to come in and take the business away. Kind of like the iPod took away the Sony Walkman franchise, or you can do something today that you couldn't have done five years ago. And that's a question I ask every entrepreneur in every pitch meeting. Why could this business have been started five years ago or not? And if the answer is, oh yeah, it could have been started five years, 10 years ago, no problem, just no one ever thought to do it, that's almost never an investment I'll want to make because I just don't believe good ideas sit out there for five or 10 years unexploited. There usually is some confluence of events that makes it now possible and it wasn't then, and usually it's something Moore's Law related. And you'll see this in almost every investment that I've made. Some of the areas where Moore's Law, uh, actually before I get to some of the areas, let me just mention one other generalization about Moore's Law. I love this quote from Matt Ridley, which might start to answer the question of why do we see exponential progress in technology, right? If it's not something magical about integrated circuits and the physics of ICs, right? If it's nothing to do with Intel whatsoever, nothing to do with integrated circuits whatsoever, well, what is it? Well, it could be the, this simple idea. I, ideas recombine and they form new ideas. Almost every invention you can think of was a recombination of prior inventions or prior ideas. There's almost never just out of nowhere comes a breakthrough idea. And so the combinatorial possibilities of idea space is growing exponentially. It's a two to the n phenomenon called Reed's Law. So if you just, in a very simple mental model, say there are n ideas on the planet that are of any merit, how could we recombine them, any pair or triplet or quadruplet of ideas into a new idea that hadn't been had before? That's growing as a two to the n power. And that also explains perhaps why the internet is so interesting to break down the boundaries between academic disciplines um, that you see both within academic campuses, campuses and across the planet. You have more minds cross-pollinating ideas than ever before, as he affectionately calls it, ideas having sex. What I mean by that is this exponential curve of progress could just be one of the many refractions of a broader trend in information and wisdom that is an ever-compounding set. And that's kind of exciting, especially as we bring more and more people online, and I'll get to that in a moment too. So industries, I, I alluded to this earlier. As Moore's Law goes along, an industry that was formerly really boring, industrial, low gross margin, unattractive like aerospace, automotive, suddenly changes. I mentioned those two examples because you can see how that's underway today, clearly. Major profound disruption occurring in industries that haven't faced a credible new entrant for decades, right? And the competitive response is fascinating to watch. That's just the beginning of what's going to ripple through every industry. Agriculture and healthcare are in the middle of it. Insurance and a variety of financial services products are in the middle of it too. And walking up and down these halls, you'll see this, right? Everything that's possible with a blockchain ledger is just a tantalizing peek into what will happen in those services industries. So I think in the future, you're going to see deep learning, just by the way, jump into a conclusion, and or the blockchain embodied in almost every startup of interest. It would be weird to ignore them, much like it would be weird to ignore the mobile phone in any internet or software-based business. If you were starting one of those five or 10 years ago and to just ignore mobility would be very odd to, to, to have a business like Uber without the thought of a, small, of a smartphone. Um, and the same, I think, will, take, will be more and more obvious that that'll be the case for deep learning and, and the blockchain going forward. Okay. Some of these industries. So robots can be made dirt cheap. You know, off-the-shelf hardware, move all the intelligence of the software and control layer, reactive control system. You can think of the entire Internet of Things writ large 
as a way to push intelligence out to the edge and to, in many ways, mimic our own biology, where you have a sensory cortex that does a lot of the pre-processing before the cloud services in the frontal lobe do big decision making, if you will. And pushing intelligence out to the edge, cheap sensors, really cheap neural networks everywhere, uh, trillions of neural networks on the planet over the next 10 years, not millions, not billions, but trillions, according, again, to uh, the CEO of NVIDIA's forecasts. And I believe that. At first, I, I couldn't imagine why we'd have so many, but, you know, there'll be several hundred per car, there'll be several hundred per device, uh, and every smart device, everything could become a smart device, every toaster, Roomba, what have you, will have these things. Autonomous vehicles are just another kind of robot, right? And what's interesting about um, the automotive sector is you could make the prediction already today that the most important car company of the future will, will be the one that has the best AI. It won't be, you know, how's their V8 engine, it won't be necessarily any particular physical engineering prowess. That gives you some advantages from time to time and elegance of design always matters. But in the long run, over statistical averages, it's going to be who has the best autonomous driving package. That's going to di dictate this. Um, these are a couple of my favorites. Um, that I had early experience with. And the moment you experience one of these autonomous driving experiences, it's kind of like electric vehicle experience. You have experienced the future, and you know that this is the inevitable future that we're going towards and just, you know, debatable how we get there and when we get there. So in this um, world, you test continuously. You gather tons of data. You do it from real driving experience. You test the vehicles in um, simulation harnesses, like a Grand Theft Auto, if you imagine that kind of a uh, gaming engine, where you can test millions and billions of miles of, exp of, of situations before hitting the real road and make these products safer than human. That, of course, is the goal. Uh, it will soon be uh, over the next let's just say over the next couple of years, you're going to see more and more Uber-like driving services where there's no, no, no steering wheel. It's just a urban a mobility solution, radically lowering the cost point uh, of these um, products and services today and, and raising their safety. You'll see it also in the restructuring of all kinds of other industries that were, you know, I mentioned aerospace. You may have been thinking SpaceX and rockets, where this, you can see what, how that's been playing out. But in the satellite industry, it's in the same transition. You can take a satellite that was the size of a school bus, miniaturize it to what you see here, fly flocks of them, and literally lower the cost of some of these products by 1,000 to 10,000 fold. And, you know, you often want entrepreneurs to have a 10x advantage, I think 1,000 to 10,000 x, right? And that's just sitting there, these ripe opportunities in industry after industry that have been untouched for decades. SpaceX itself, um, and we were, uh, Genevieve and I were there at the Falcon Heavy launch, but the most impressive thing for some wasn't just, of course, Starman heading off towards Mars. It was those two boosters coming back in synchrony, like in the simulation, landing, and this photo that I took doesn't show it particularly well, landing almost at the same time, exactly like it was simulated. And then having it work the first time, as it did for the Falcon 9's first flight, as it did for the first attempt to bring the booster back over the ocean, there was no platform at the time. These things working the first time was unprecedented in the rocket building business, right? The Atlas took 13 crashes before they really got a cadence of success. The ability to simulate can take so much time out of product development cycles, and there are so many industries where that is the main process advantage that we've seen. Like, why is there something new and exciting happening in automotive or aerospace? You could say, well, we can simulate long before we build. We can launch a great product out of the chute. A most recent one, even more interesting, arguably, for the future, than the Falcon Heavy and the return of the boosters, which lowers the cost of access to space, was the first test flight of these two satellites called Tintin. You can see a real one on the left and, and then the modified version deployed on the right. These are the beginning of what will eventually be a broadband network of satellites. In fact, I'll just show this visual of this. Thousands, perhaps 4,000 of these satellites circling over the North-South Pole, blanketing the, the world in broadband. So imagine you're in rural Africa, you're on a boat, you're on a plane, you're in a remote anywhere in the outback. You can get a gigabit up and down for a $200 base station, no moving parts, $200 for the entire cost of goods, right? And that, I'm not announcing that price point. That is the estimate from actually other companies. Let me just say there's other startups who are estimating that price point. So I'm not saying that that's a specific number. It's just that ballpark, affordable, light up an entire village, bring the internet everywhere, go from two to six billion people online much sooner than any forecaster had been thinking prior, because all this stuff's going up over the next couple of years. And it's going to be a profound change, not only for the number of people connected to the global internet, who are currently not really part of the global economy in any meaningful way. It also allows all those ideas to cross-pollinate. They're going to be having access to online education. They're going to want to succeed just as much as everyone else on the planet. And they can couple to the global economy like never before. And that's incredibly exciting in a very indirect way, a way that you probably can't quantify that the pace of innovation is likely to skyrocket simply because the number of innovators is going to skyrocket. It should roughly triple in the next 10 years. 
So I'm going to transition to deep learning briefly. Um, the reason I mention this is it's my favorite example of an iterative algorithm. Um, I remember that was in the title of the talk, and they've asked me to talk about this. Let me just broad, broaden the conversation for a moment. You could think of evolution really simple. Variation, selection, rinse and repeat. Wherever you have those elements, you get evolution. It's kind of an interesting little corollary. You, just, you always get evolution when you do that. Um, Nothing interesting happens in a couple iterations of evolution, right? Your great-grandchildren look kind of like humans, right? It takes many generations before something that doesn't look anything like a human comes from us, right? I mean, biologically. It's glacial. But over millions of years, interesting stuff happens, right? Compress that cycle with deep learning. Take millions of years, millions of iterations in the development of an artificial brain in silicon, and you get the same exact phenomenon coming out in the way you can build vision systems, auditory systems, all the sensory cortex and reactive control systems of early biology. That's where we are today. We haven't built a funnel lobe, but we've largely done better than human on sensory cortex activities. What is it? For those who don't know, you have this series of nodes, quite simply, very abstractly modeled in the brain. They sum inputs, they have a nonlinear activation function, and they connect in this ever-growing network. OK. What's fascinating is that it works at all. It's been an area of research for a number of years, but there have been a lot of research, a lot of advances recently, which I'll just mention briefly. When I started studying it in the 80s, actually, <laughs> in the late 80s is when I was starting a PhD in neural networks and parallel computing, um, they weren't very powerful. And the whole field kind of went nowhere. There was some speech recognition tasks that were applicable to this, but it largely uh, withered for a while until the University of Toronto folks really fired it back up and found some major breakthroughs. And what had changed in 20 years? Well. The things that mainly changed, the internet gave you a lot of training data sets to, to work on. If you want to get a million, a billion photos of something, you, you, you can do that a little more easily today than you could in the 80s. I mean, a lot more easily. You've had some algorithmic advances, but frankly, that's probably the least important of the three. Um, the last is just simply Moore's Law, you know, back to that 120 years of Moore's Law, and the realization that you can run these things on NVIDIA GPUs. So switching from an Intel CPU to a massively parallel architecture that's frankly more similar to the brain was the major breakthrough. So back in the 80s, you might have had like a 1 to 10 million synapses in your artificial brain model. Jump to like work in 2012-ish time frame, so not even recently, with Google Brain when they find cats on the internet. On the internet. Uh, it's more like a billion neurons, you know, and we're way beyond that now, more like 10 billion. But we're still a ways from the 100 trillion that we have as an adult or the quadrillion we're born with before massive synaptic pruning of the infant. It's sort of a use it or lose it in the, um, in the cognitive sense of uh, early cognitive development. Um, we, can, we can mimic a lot of that now in our silicon systems. So these get applied. I won't, I'm actually going to skip over this because of time. There's all kinds of industries to which deep learning can be applied to, much like the blockchain can be applied to just about everything. You should imagine that deep learning will be embedded in everything over time. Every decision support system, everywhere that you're trying to recognize patterns in data. I think about how broad that is. Another way to phrase it is, Every single product at Google uses deep learning. Everything. It's the fundamental underpinning of search. It's long since moved from that page rank thing you heard about. It's moved to an entirely different kind of framework based on deep learning. Similar inputs, but different decision um, uh, vectors and different methods of engineering, which, by the way, are totally foreign to normal engineering methods. The, it, it's sort of like you're creating a black box defined by its interfaces with an interior that's inscrutable, again, much like our own brain. Right? We all, everyone in the room knows how to make an intelligent machine. You have a baby. Right? Doesn't mean you understand how that brain works, right? But you could learn slowly over time how to make the next one better and the next one better. It's sort of like cultural evolution. It takes decades, but we get better over time at parenting, right? That analogy is better to what's going on in the field of deep learning than engineering. It's more like parenting than it is engineering. I'll come back to that. I'm going to briefly mention, I'm going to skip over this actually. I'm going to skip the computational substrate. I'll just make one statement. Just like you saw with Bitcoin miners going from left to right, Right, everything that matters is on custom ASICs today. The same is underway for deep learning, right? Started with Intel chips, major breakthrough in 2012 with Hinton and his crew moving it to GPUs. Microsoft and others doing research on field programmable gate arrays. And for those who don't know the acronyms, this is moving from more like a monolithic single processor the way you might think of a computer to something that's closer to the brain, fine-grained, thousands to tens of thousands of little compute elements with little memory scattered all throughout them, almost like a fabric of computing on the far right. And that far right itself is splitting into a variety. There's a ton of startups doing digital chips, custom digital chips to do deep learning. Other, there's only one I know of that's doing an analog chip. That's one I'm invested in, full disclosure. And then there's quantum computing, which is even more mind-bending. Um, but I'll probably skip that. 
for today. The analog one is just like the brain. Our brain is analog. This is the most power efficient way to do it. So there's about a hundred fold improvement in power and speed and cost. So this is the thing that enables a little brain and everything. When I said there'd be a trillion deep learning engines scattered across the planet, well, you're going to need them to be pennies, right? Pennies in cost. And that's how you do it. You put it in a flash memory array and the memory array is so efficient that you can do a matrix multiply and add in a single transistor. For anyone who does chip design, kind of mind bending, Matrix meaning a multi-bit multiply and add step in a single transistor. That, that's how you get there. I'm going to skip this whole quantum thing because I'm running out of time. So I'm going to actually, sorry about this, quantum computing is kind of interesting, but I want to jump to this last two slides and wrap it up because I said I talked about iterative algorithms. The deep learning example of how powerful it is, the ability to build complex systems that transcend human understanding, that exceed human capacity, and that's happening all over the place, like in medical imaging, in, in radiology, in pathology, you can do a better job than the experts already. And they're training them with algorithms that are generic learning machines. The practitioners don't understand pathology. They don't understand radiology. They just have the dating and the training sets and they build these artificial brains that do a better job than a human. That's really profound. It's profound with, on labor markets. It's profound on the power of disruption. The new entrants don't need to have domain expertise. And it means that the practitioners of this field don't integrate well usually with the rest of the team or the engineering effort because no one can explain how the thing works. They can't prove that it's safe. They can't prove that it doesn't have errors. They don't have any of that sort of normal warm fuzzy feeling around engineered artifacts. So it is a bit mind bending in a lot of organizations that don't go whole hog and embracing it, but it's incredibly powerful. And again, it's not just deep learning. It's directed evolution in bioengineering. It's everything Steve Wolfram gets excited about in his book, A New Kind of Science in Cellular Automata. It's this weird branch called genetic programming that designed things like that antenna that you see that outperforms anything of human design. Everything in neural networks and deep learning. And this field called generative design that's that sort of gives you these wonderful organic designs that things usually 3D printed that Autodesk and others are leading. All of these are similar in the notion that they can transcend the limits of human ingenuity. They can give us a new way of doing engineering. And if I was to wrap it all up in one bold statement, I think it's the biggest advance in how we do engineering since the scientific method itself. I mean, literally nothing since the scientific method helps us do engineering better. And so that's why I think it's important for everyone. Last quote from Danny Hills, computer scientist. He concluded his book on computer science with the provocative conclusion, this was decades ago, that the biggest achievement of our efforts will be to transcend the whole concept of engineering and to be able to create more than we can understand. I think we're ready doing that writ large. So that is it. I want to thank you very much. I apologize for going a minute over and just share that this is an incredibly exciting time for the future, an incredibly exciting time to be forging the future. And I think all the entrepreneurs in the room, um, it could never be a better time to go out there and find uh, the low hanging fruit of opportunity. Thank you.